Hello and welcome to this tutorial. Before we start off with the topic for this video, I just want to mention that I think I might have made a mistake in the previous video where I talked about extracting the endpoint interface out of the implementation. So if you remember, this was the implementation product catalog. It had all the annotations. What I did in the last video was extract it out to a product catalog interface, and then the interface had all these annotations, right? And the product catalog had just one annotation, the web service with just one property, which is the interface which contains all the all the information. Now, what is the mistake that I did? Let's check out the interface where I'm overriding all these names. So you see here, there is a name, a port name, service name, and target namespace. So I'm overriding all these with my own custom values, and I'm not overriding anything in the product catalog. Of course, the endpoint interface is just a pointer, but here is where I'm specifying all these values, right? So now if I deploy this uh, application, what do you think would be the name of the service that gets generated out of this code? Well, it should be the service name that I'm giving over here, which is the test mart catalog service, right? Well, surprisingly, well, at least surprising to me, I realized that that's not the case. So this is uh, the application deployed in Glassfish. And if I open TestMart, now let me view the endpoint and the visdl. And here you see the name of the service is product catalog service. And uh, if I scroll down, the name of the port is product catalog port. So these values that I've given over here, which is the port name and the service name, are not getting applied at all. But, however, you notice the namespace here, namespace is getting the value of testmart.com, which is the value that I'm giving over here. So apparently the target namespace value is getting applied, but these values are not getting applied. And the way to get that to work is to remove this out of the interface, save this and add it over here in the implementation. And now if I save and publish this, and uh, refresh this, now we, you see the product catalog service is not valid anymore, and I can access the testmat catalog service. And uh, the port name is also the value that I've specified over here. So I didn't get a chance to troubleshoot this. I'm not really sure what's happening, if it's a bug or if it's an expected behavior. So if you happen to know, please leave a comment and I'll update the video or the blog post with what's happening. Okay, so now let's move on to what I wanna talk about in this tutorial. So one of the things that we saw in the previous tutorial was the return type being a custom data type, right? We created a new class called product and uh, this was a custom data type that a web service returned. So I created a new method called get products version two, which returned a list of my product custom objects. And what did we have to do to get this to work? We didn't have to do anything, right? It happened by default, it happened out of the box. Here you see the response is actually in a nice XML structure. So this is our basic Java bean, just getting converted to XML. So in this tutorial, we're gonna understand a little bit about how that's happening and how we can customize it. So given a Java class, given a class like this, if I would ask you to convert an instance of this to an XML, how easy or how hard of a task would that be? I have a, a product object instance, I have a specific name value, I have a specific SKU value and a specific price value. Now, if I have to convert this instance to an XML, it should be a fairly simple task because if you think about how things would work in an XML, so you have a root value, you have a root node, and inside that you have individual elements for each of the member variables. So I have three member variables here, so I'd have three XML elements, right? So it should be fairly straightforward. Now things could get a little bit tricky if this were a collection, if it was a list or a set, or if it was uh, another complex type as a member variable. So this was actually a reference to 
another class, which again had a whole lot of member variables of its own. But even then, so it's actually very easy to map an instance of a Java object to a piece of XML that contains all the information that the Java object contains. So it's actually fairly straightforward for us to do the mapping. And one of the technologies that actually helps us in this conversion is a technology called JAXP. And uh, what it helps us do is to actually bind different parts of a Java object with different parts of an XML structure and vice versa. So it actually helps us convert a Java object to an XML or a piece of XML code to a Java object. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to do this uh, here. I'm not gonna go into the details of JAXP because that's a completely different topic, but I'm gonna briefly discuss how to apply JAXP here to get this conversion more to our liking. So this conversion is happening by default, but I'm gonna use JAXP to customize some of the things that's happening over here. The good thing about JAXP though is that it doesn't really need a lot of help out of the box. For example, let's take this class. So I have a public class, class name, whatever be the class name. So instinctively you would know that the way to convert this into an XML is to have a start and end tag, right? So the contents of the class name are gonna be bound by this start and end tag. And if the, you know, if the class has like three member variables, like I've mentioned over here, they are gonna be individual XML elements. So a direct translation would be something like this. So var1 would have an XML element with the value, similarly for var2 and var3. So the value of the instance would be bound between these two tags, okay? Now, if this is a list or another uh, class as a member variable, that would probably be nested over here, but it would follow the same structure. So by default, you don't really need to give a lot of information to Jaxp to make it uh, do the conversion properly. It knows how the conversion needs to be done by default. One scenario where you would need to give extra information to JAXP is if you want something to change from the default. Like for example, I wanna change the name here to my own custom name. I don't want it to be the name of the variable. I want it to be my own custom name. So in this case, I would have to give this, that additional information to JAXP to say, hey, when you when you convert this particular member variable to XML, don't use the name of the member variable, use my own specific name instead, okay? So that's uh, pretty much how you would customize a class with Jaxp. So when you have a Java class and you want it to be converted to Jaxp and whenever you need some kind of an override like this, what you would do is provide that extra information. And once Jaxp reads that extra information, it knows what to do. And this extra information actually happens to be Jaxp annotations. So you actually annotate the class with specific Jaxp annotations and then Jaxp knows what to do. So let's say you have an instance of this class, right? You have a Java object and uh, it has this Jaxp annotations at runtime. So when you, when you give this object, when you give an instance of this object to a Jaxp runtime, the Jaxp runtime is gonna look at these annotations and it's gonna know how to convert this to an XML, you know, XML piece of code. And then you get the output XML based on the configuration that you've provided over here. So this is uh, what we're gonna do now if for our product class. We're gonna provide some Jaxp annotations to let Jaxp customize how our XML is gonna turn out. And uh, we'll add these annotations and deploy it and see how it works in the next tutorial. Thanks for watching.